information will be obtained and conveyed to the right person in the right office to get back to them to follow up and do an intake. So you don't have to worry that, well, I'm in Adams County, which office do I call? And you can call any legal action number. And in fact, I believe on our website now, there is a statewide 855 number in addition to the local office toll-free numbers. So just put legalaction.org into a search you'll get a number and clients can call that number and go to the right place if it's the sort of work we do. I work in public benefits, which involves Social Security, Disability, and SSI. It also involves W-2, child care, emergency assistance, bed and care plus medical assistance, caretaker supplement, I'm sure I've missed something, food share, and, and various other types of benefits. Legal action also provides assistance in certain housing cases, consumer matters, including debt collection and foreclosure, family law involving domestic violence and threats of domestic violence, um, barriers to employment, uh, such as criminal records. And, and, and we also have a number of what we call special projects which serve defined populations rather than just low-income people. And those include victims of violence and domestic abuse, elderly individuals, people over 60, who have been subjected to physical or economic abuse. And we also have an agricultural farm worker project it's not limited to farm workers, it's agricultural workers throughout the state. And that focuses principally on employment law issues, employment, uh, protective employment uh, law, and public benefits. <coughs> what I'm going to talk about today is SSI and Social Security Disability. And the focus will be on how to work with people once they're on benefits. Although we'll talk a little bit about what you can do to help people who are applying for benefits. Because the disability determination is very fact specific and individual specific, specific to the individual circumstances, all sorts of circumstances, age, education, experience, and their specific conditions. I'm not gonna get into that, though those are very complicated. Uh, matters, and frankly, because of the type of work I do and the way we focus in our office, the disability determination itself, is, I'm not the best person to talk about. So I can answer general questions about the disability determination, but I'm not going to be able to talk to you about your client who's got these particular conditions and what do we do. I can tell you what sort of information you need to gather or your client needs to gather in order to move ahead with a disability application, but not whether your client is disabled and how to prove it in a particular case. The types of work that we do relating to disability is work on 
cases that involve the termination or reduction or cessation of Social Security disability or SSI benefits and payment issues, overpayments, collection of overpayments, changes in the amount of payments. Because of our limited resources and because of the availability of attorneys in private practice to work on disability cases that have merit or appear to have merit, we don't work on the application cases. That means we don't represent people generally who are applying for benefits at any stage of the application process. The application, reconsideration, the ALJ hearing, appeals council review or federal court review, though we do refer those people to a list of attorneys that we have who handle these types of cases, to the private bar in general, and to an organization, an organization that's called the National Organization of Social Security Claims Representatives. And we have found that because of the availability of attorney's fees out of past due benefits to private attorneys, that individuals who have uh, a case that seems worth pursuing are able to get representation. Now they do have to be able to come to that private attorney or to NASCAR with some information to back up their disability claim. Um, so that uh, the, the uh, advocate or attorney sees that there's something they will pursue. The importance of these benefits for our clients and your clients is that they provide a stable source of income support. So rather than relying on um, W-2, which is limited and a fairly low amount of benefits, and which can be fairly arbitrary and uncertain in terms of um, getting it, uh, these are benefits you can count on within certain parameters. They also allow people to work and augment this income, again, within certain limits that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> Getting SSDI and SSI also gives people access to health care coverage, and we'll talk about the distinctions between the two programs on health care coverage that, that comes with those. One of the things that we all need to understand and that our clients need to understand is that built into the system are certain checks and reviews to ensure that people remain eligible and to ensure that people are getting the benefits that they ought to be getting and are not getting benefits that they shouldn't be getting or more in benefits than they should be getting. That is built into the system. There are reviews, there are mechanisms for that that people need to be aware of so that they don't wind up tripping into problems. The other thing we need to understand is that we are now working with these clients in an atmosphere where fraud is always in the background in terms of how the institutions and programs look at recipients and examine cases. We have to be cognizant of the fact that for any number of reasons, we now have this heightened concern about fraud and greater scrutiny of people for the purpose of determining whether there's possible fraud. And we need to help clients understand their, their obligations and their rights to avoid um, getting into a situation that may involve a fraud investigation or to respond to any charges of fraud where there is no fraud. The next uh, page some important terms uh, that you need to know and some of the terms that I'll be using. And we'll talk about the distinction between some of these programs here, but there, there are two discrete programs. There's Social Security Disability Insurance, otherwise known as Title II, and also called SSDI. And there's Supplemental Security Income, SSI, and that is known as Title XVI. Substantial gainful activity is an important term because that is a measure of disability, one of the measures of disability, whether you can engage in what's called substantial gainful activity. Earnings is income that you receive for doing work, and that includes self-employment. 
assets or financial resources that are not income. They may have once been income. They could be savings from past income that you have accumulated, but it's also other types of property, as well as money that you receive in, in all kinds of ways. Income means anything you get of value, including in kind. And eligibility means that you're meeting the program. There are, are some common elements between SSI and SSDA. The first is that, and this is at the eligibility level, determining eligibility. Once you start getting benefits, the analysis shifts slightly. Um, but to get somebody on benefits, the first thing is the individual cannot currently be engaged in substantial gainful activity. And what that means is receiving income from work, including self-employment, of at this point $1,170 a month or more. And you should be unable to engage in substantial gainful activity due to a medical condition that you can establish. And you have to provide medical proof of that disabling medical condition. Now, one of the things that comes up often when we're dealing with clients who call us is figuring out, are we talking about SSI or Social Security Disability or both? Because it's possible to get both if your disability SSI SSDI <coughs> amount is low enough, SSI will jump in to fill the gap in terms of bringing you up to a minimum income level. And one of the ways to figure out if we're talking about SSI as opposed to SSDI, or possibly both, is uh, there are shortcuts. Are you getting 8378 from the state? If you're getting 8378 from the state, that means that you're getting at least $1 in federal SSI. So we know this individual is an SSI and we have to worry about the financial factors. Now that doesn't mean that the individual is also getting SSDI, but at least we know there that they're getting SSI. And we, you know, when we're representing someone, obviously we'll get all the details eventually. <coughs> But when we're initially talking to the client, it's helpful to know what we're talking about because we know more about what questions to ask and what we're looking for. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about an individual applying for benefits and how we can help individuals who are applying for benefits, not with the actual proof of disability, but with the sorts of information and steps they can take to move their application along and help prove disability. There's basic information that needs to be provided, and it's all listed there, and it's listed in your handout. I'm not going to go through it all, but basic demographic information. It's important that people understand that a lot of the questions that are asked here may not seem to make sense to them, but they all have to do with determining eligibility in some way or another for one or the other program. For example, People may be annoyed if they're divorced and they're asked questions about their former spouse. Well, if you were married for 10 years, you may be able to get benefits um, on your former spouse's account. That's why questions about that are asked, about the dates of your marriage, the length of your marriage, your for information about your former spouse. Minor children, if you get disability benefits, social security disability as opposed to SSI, they may be able to receive benefits as well on, uh, on your account if you're getting disability benefits. A spouse can also get benefits on your account if you're receiving disability benefits because they're considered your dependents. And that applies to children who are living with a former spouse or former partner. So again, that's why questions about this sort of stuff are asked. And it's, it's often tough with clients who may have mental or emotional issues to get them to understand that this information is not being requested because they're being nosy. It's because it may help them get benefits or access a certain type of benefit that they might not otherwise get if we didn't have this information or if Social Security didn't have this information. And it may also get their kids benefits, even kids who aren't living with them. And for people who are paying child support or have a child support application, that's fairly important because those auxiliary benefits for dependent children 
help them meet their child support obligation and avoid child support arrears. Social Security is going to want to know about your work history and about your education and training because that goes into the determination of disability. That includes whether you were in special education, how far you got in school, the details of the work you did and your educational background. Military service is also going to be asked about because of the nature of the military service <coughs> that may inform the determination about the experience you have, the knowledge you have, and what you can and can't do. Financial information matters in two respects. One is your current income, if any of it is from employment, goes to the are you performing substantial gainful activity, which is critical to the determination for either program. The other is, as I'm going to explain in a minute, SSI is an income maintenance program. You have to be both disabled and meet the federal government's definition for purposes of SSI of being financially needed. So the amount of income you have and the amount of resources that you have uh, are important to determine whether you're eligible for SSI. Your condition or conditions, of course, are important. Information about your health care providers, how to contact them, <coughs> how to access your medical records, information about the medication you're taking or have taken in the past, and also information about people, the names and contact information of people who have regular contact with you, who see you day to day. Your doctor may be able to provide a diagnosis and certain information about your limitations. But your neighbor or your sister or your grandmother who spends a lot of time with you or an adult child who helps them negotiate day-to-day -day life may also be very important in saying, well, when this happens, she loses it. She can't function. She can't think. She can't answer questions. Or I've seen her try to you know, bend down to get a frying pan to make scrambled eggs. If she bends down too far, she can't get up, and I've got to make the scrambled eggs for her. And first, I've got to sit her down for a while. So there are both the technical or scientific or medical aspects of disability, and there are the practical aspects, which can you can establish through lay people, not through experts, not through doctors. It all comes together. So that's why. This is something that you need to help a client think through. And even though Social Security may not contact these people or interview them, once you get to the hearing stage, knowing about these people and having been in contact with them and knowing what they have to say is fairly important um, so that you can help the client go to the advocate or the attorney with all of this information and that advocate or attorney has a head start in preparing for the hearing, although let me tell you there's a long time to get ready for that hearing. You of course need to prove your age, you need to provide information relating to your status as a United States citizen or as a resident of your status in this country if you're not a United States citizen. Again, a lot of financial information, um, W-2 forms, pay stubs, tax returns, bank statements, if you're getting any kind of other disability <coughs> benefits or a pension or anything like that, another record showing income. Some of the more practical stuff is helping people compile this information so that when they go to the Social Security office, or for that matter, when we're talking about any benefit program, so that people go to these meetings or these telephone interviews with the information they need so that they go on to access or into the Social Security website with the information they need to complete forms and applications. A lot of times clients have a lot going on. They're dealing with various programs, they're dealing, in our case, with homelessness, and trying to keep track of so many things just to get their current, today's needs met. And we have to help them in many ways pull stuff together so that beyond meetings to date, meeting today's needs, they're able to respond to requests to help them advance their applications here. Sometimes we've got to help them make sure that they go to appointments. Um, 
um, if you miss too many doctor's appointments, that doctor is eventually going to stop seeing you. And even if you're already on benefits, you need to be able to provide ongoing evidence of your disability. There are, there are periodic reviews. And if we get frustrated with our clients who are trying to help, imagine how these theoretically neutral people, decision makers, are going to respond to our clients if they don't have the information they've been asked to provide or if they're late to appointments or if they come unprepared. Um, whether we like it or not, um, the people processing these cases, making determinations, they're doing a job, they've got pressures on them, they're, they're going to respond more to complete files, to complete information, and they're going to set aside or not give as much credence to cases where they didn't get what they asked for and they don't understand why they didn't get what they asked for. And it's often hard with our clients to say, okay, we're going to, we've got to get our clients ready. We've got to help them. I had a hearing yesterday um, in a W-2 case or a fact finding in a W-2 case where the client gets very upset in any kind of stressful situation where anywhere she's asked a question or hears a statement that sounds like a challenge to her. And I had to spend a lot of time with her explaining to her how the process works and why I was even going to ask her questions in a way that did not wrap the whole thing up but that the words came out of her mouth so that she could explain herself. Because who better to explain things than her? And you have to take the time with clients to let them experience that upset and maybe have that panic attack with you. And then once they're done with it, explain that you understand what they're going through, but also explain that even if they have a panic attack in the process, it's important that the decision maker hear from them, and actually, not that we want to provoke a panic attack, but that if we're pro providing mental health records that show that they have a condition that affects their ability to function the way normal people do, that it's not going to hurt their case to see somebody, for, for somebody, a decision maker, to see their inability to function in a stressful setting. Now again, we don't want to do that in order to cause them discomfort. But we want to let them know that it's important for the manifestations of their disability to be seen by decision makers. Yeah. Yes? I have a question. Um, you talk about the conflict of interest and the Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. Sometimes Social Security <laughs> will ask an applicant or even somebody who's being reviewed to go to a consultative exam. They have contracts with, with doctors, therapists, all sorts of mental health professionals. And they can't ask you to do that. And you should go to a consultative exam. Understand that uh, some of the consultants are not so great. That's okay. That's why you want your own medical records from your own healthcare providers. Um, the, we've got to help the clients understand that they can be asked to do this and that they should be without necessarily um, accepting insulting or abusive behavior and they're not normally going to expect experience that they may they may detect skepticism um, not to let that shut them down not to let that turn them off as upset as they may be by it I'm sure we all experience that when we're working trying to achieve something for a client when we run into somebody who we need to convince uh, that our client deserves this, that you need to do this for a client. And they, you can hear it in their voice. You can see it in their face. And I gotta sit there like I did yesterday at this fact finding and just remain calm and say, now you talked about this and this and this, but if we look at, you know, you didn't talk about the answer to question 21 that the therapist gave you, would you tell me what that answer says? And we need to remain calm and we need to tell our clients that 
you can be, in, you're inside, you can be saying all sorts of things about this person, thinking all sorts of things about this person, but don't, don't let that shut you down in terms of providing clear, complete, accurate information. And there's nothing wrong with, especially with someone who has communication issues, mental health and emotional issues, for somebody to go along with them to the consultative exam um, to sort of help them remain calm or help them explain things if necessary. Although we need to step back as much as possible and let our client communicate information about themselves. Help them when we need to. Yeah, I would strongly advocate for people to go with those to clients because especially if it's like a therapist or something that they're being asked to see, a lot of times if you've worked with that person for a long time, after they've spoken with that per the, the um, participant, sometimes they'll ask um, you to have a, like a short five, ten minute meeting about your experience, your first time experience with them, and that can be huge in, in helping to prove the other thing to talk to clients about when they're going to these consultative exams or talking to somebody other than their own treatment providers and case, um, case managers is make sure you understand what they're asking you. A lot of times people are very perfunctory in talking to you and will use terminology that is common in their profession um, and may be common in talking to white middle class people and upper middle class people, but is not understood by people who grew up poor and outside the system um, and just, you know, have, are not accustomed to, to that sort of terminology. Um, and they may refer to something by different terms. You know, somebody may ask you something about this and you go, no, when in fact, Oh, if we use different language, the answer would be yes. So sometimes it's important for the person who's with them to be able to say, do you understand what he just asked you? And again, at this fact-finding mystery, when my client was asked questions, I would come back when it was my turn and say, Ms. So-and-so asked you about this. Do you understand what this word means? And it doesn't have to be that formal in this setting, but be respectful in the interaction. <clears throat> As much of a pain as this is for our clients because they're receiving all kinds of notices from all kinds of people. They've got to read the notices or at least come to you with those notices or letters so that you can help them understand them. And oftentimes, um, a problem that can be remedied uh, if you act on it on time <coughs> being a bigger problem that can't be remedied because the client didn't act on it, didn't come to someone for help soon enough. One of the biggest frustrations I have in talking to people on intake is talking to people who are calling me about a bad repair plus overpayment and they got the notice of the overpayment six months ago and didn't call anybody and didn't appeal. Well, six months later is too late to do anything about it. You can't appeal, you can't challenge it. There are deadlines with Social Security as well. When you get a letter from Social Security making a decision about your case, changing the amount of your benefits, telling you that you've been overpaid, you've got 65 days from the date of the letter, or 60 days from the date you receive it. The safer thing, I think, is what's the date on the letter? Let's count 65 days. Let's not worry about the mail got delayed, you haven't, you know, just. Let's do 65 days and, you know, be safe. Although, you know, if somebody can prove that they actually got the letter 12 days after it was, after the date on the letter because of whatever reason, you know, a hurricane, you know, there was no mail delivery for two weeks, it probably won't be mail delivery for a month in Puerto Rico. Um, stuff like that. Then you can go from the 60 days. Um, be on time and be as prepared as you can be for these appointments, for these meetings. Again, we're talking about people who, whether intentionally or not, they have, they have, a, they exercise a lot of judgment. And whether intentionally or not, they form opinions that affect the way they treat people and the way they make decisions. And if they come into a meeting with you annoyed because you're late, for not a very good reason, you're already a step behind, and you've got something to overcome. And it should not be a factor in their decision, but we cannot help it that we're all human. 
and we all react to things. And I think we all see that in ourselves in some ways, and we have to get past stuff, even when we're trying to help someone. So let's do everything we can to make sure that the clients are prepared and on time and have what they were asked to have, or can explain what they're doing to get it, or why they can't get it. And then they should get help with it. <coughs> now, um, so we've already talked about the common element between social security disability and disability. Inability to engage in a substantial gainful activity because of a medically determinable condition. And again, there are multiple factors. <coughs> your age, your education, your work experience, and your physical or mental conditions. Now, there are other factors that go into determining your eligibility. For Social Security Disability, it's an insurance program. Every time we get a paycheck, we're paying into the Social Security system. And it's not just for retirement. It's for the disability program. So eligibility for Social Security Disability is based on something called your insured status based on your work record. And there's quarters of coverage and how much money you have to earn to get a quarter of coverage and all that. And that can get fairly, if you work with it regularly, it's not a big deal. But it's a hard thing to get into and understand. What we ask people applying for disability or who are looking for disability benefits are basically, have you worked five out of the past 10 years? That pretty much covers your quarters of coverage. Coverage for disability benefits is different than coverage for retirement benefits. You have to have insured status based on relatively recent work. And that's more or less having worked five out of the past 10 years. It can actually be less than that based on your earnings, but that's the, the lazy and fairly safe way. Um, and you'll find out from Social Security whether they, think, whether they think you're covered or not. When you go in and apply, it's probably best to apply for both and then Social Security looks at your record. And you may often get a letter saying, you're not eligible for SSDI because you're not insured, but we're still looking at your SSI case. <clears throat> SSI requires um, not just disability or inability to work, but it requires that you meet income and asset limits because it's an income maintenance program for low affordance. <coughs> It's similar to W-2 or food stamps, except there's a disability element to it, and it's a cash benefits program. Uh, so um, I can be fairly wealthy. I can have interest income and dividends and all sort of all kinds of other money coming in. But because of my physical condition, I can no longer engage in substantial gainful activity, and I have insured status. I can get SSDI no matter how much money I make. That's based on my insured status and my being disabled. And I get a certain amount based on my contributions um, throughout my, my working life. If I have all that income and I'm disabled, I can't get SSI. Because SSI is going to look at my current income, whatever it's from, and my assets. Now your benefit amount is calculated in two different ways again. Your Social Security Disability benefit amount is based on your earnings record. There's a formula for that. Your SSI benefit amount is based again on your financial circumstances. There is a maximum amount. Right now it's $735 a month for an individual. I think it's, 11, it's further in here, we'll go over it again. Something like $1,100 a month for a married couple if they're both disabled and meet the SSI requirement. <coughs> that maximum of $735 is reduced by any other income you receive. And it's not just employment income. Um, it can be income of other members of your household. It can be who you live with 
and what household expenses you contribute to. It can be whether anybody else is paying for your food or shelter. So that income would be deemed or counted to you. So those are that's all information that your client, you and your client need to know in order to be prepared to deal with issues of getting and remaining on SSI. Yes? So when they're looking at income, like from a job and reducing uh, maximum benefit for SSI, do you know if they look at gross or net income? I'm going to get in, it's gross, and I'm going to get into the calculation in a little bit, but it's gross. Most of these programs, that's another thing to talk to clients about. Makes perfect sense if you work, you see what your check says you're getting. That's not the way it works for food stamps, that's not the way it works for bad care, that's not the way it works for bad W-2. It's your gross income. And that's not the way it works for SSI, it's your gross income. Your hourly wage by the number of hours that you work added up before any deduction. Um, so everything that, that, whether they income, the workers of their household, whether they pay rent, all that affects whether, how much they actually receive. So instead of an increase based off of those, it will be decreased. Is that Correct. Way? All of that can affect depending on the particular circumstances. Nothing is going to make your SSI go up. It only works down. Okay. They only put a hole in the bucket. They don't fill it. So if someone's paying for your rent, that could decrease. They're going to count that dollar for dollar. So even if they pay for their own rent, because they say whether you pay for household No, well, there's, no, no, there's a difference here between what Melissa said and what you're asking just now. Well, um, if if um, I pay your rent for you, I have a kid who's on SSI, an adult child on SSI, and I'm paying her rent. That's going to be counted as income for her. Now, if you live in a household with others and you don't pay any rent, that's going to affect how they look at your SSI and how much SSI you get. If you live in a household with others and pay your share of rent and food, then none of that is. Then you get the full amount of SSI unless you have other income. Uh, okay. Understand. Okay, and that got a little more complicated than I wanted it to get. <laughs> so, again, the SSI benefit amount is seven hundred thirty-five dollars a month. That's the federal amount for an individual, and eleven hundred three dollars a month for an eligible married couple. The first twenty dollars of income from any source each month is ignored. If you work, that income gets fairly generous treatment in the calculation. The first um, $65 of your earnings in a month are ignored. And then after that $65 deduction, we look at the remainder of your earnings and ignore half of that. Say that again. <laughs> okay, let's say, okay, let's do this. You, your income is $165 a month from work. We ignore the first $65, we're left with 100. We ignore half of that, so we ignore 50. And actually, there's that $20 deduction as well, so we're down to $30. They're only going to count $30 against your SSI. So, so but if somebody gives you $165, if you win $165 on a scratch-off ticket, all of that is going to be counted because it's not earnings. Earnings are treated differently than other income. Yes? Oh, I was just going to say, I like to think of it as for every two dollars you're making, after that like sixty-five dollars or the twenty dollars, um, they you get the down your benefit by one. Yeah. yeah, by one dollar. Yeah. So in your example, they would take that thirty dollars off, and you'd be off the seven hundred five instead of seven hundred. Yes, assuming that you're getting the maximum benefit. Yeah. Okay. Is that what you're well, the the point to remember is that if you receive if you're on SSI and you're receiving any amount of income, it matters. If it's earned income, you're in better shape. And all of this is important to know because there are reporting requirements that we're going to talk about. <laughs> Uh, and if you don't comply with those reporting requirements, it can trip you up in a couple of different ways. Now, I wanted to talk for a minute about related benefits. The types of benefits that come along with Social Security Disability or SSI. And remember, because the SSDI, the disability benefits, are based on your earnings record, you may wind up having worked 
for barely five of the 10 years at a minimum wage job and maybe not even full time. So when they add it all up and give you a disability benefit, that's $435 a month. <coughs> well, that's under the income limit for SSI. So SSI is gonna kick in to bring you up. And of that 435 in disability benefits or Title II that you get, 20 is ignored. So you're gonna get the difference between the 735 and 415 in SSI. And they're, they're, we're getting, in a minute we'll get to the, the importance of getting any amount of SSI. If you get Social Security disability benefits, a dependent spouse and dependent children may also be eligible for benefits on your account. And if you get Social Security disability benefits, and I don't get this, why it is that a disabled person has to wait 24 months in order to get health care. But once you have received, uh, once you have been disabled and SSDI eligible for 24 months, <coughs> Medicare eligibility kicks in. That's Medicare Part A, Part B, and Part D. Now, being eligible for Medicare doesn't mean you get it for free. You will still have to pay the Medicare Part B premium. Part B is to go to the doctor. Part A is hospitalization. Part B is regular doctor's visits. Part D is the drug coverage. And you may be better off in Wisconsin's drug coverage than Part D. There is a Part C. Part C is Medicare Advantage, which is you go into an HMO instead of having a Medicare card that you can take to any, any provider. If you get SSI, it's different. First of all, if you get $1 in SSI a month, you get $83.78 from the state in um, a state supplement. So that's another, and that doesn't count against your SSI. That's added to your SSI. If you have your children living with you and you get SSI, you also get what's called a caretaker supplement. Uh, now, they do do an income calculation for that, and both parents living with the child must be on SSI in order for the caretaker supplement to be paid for that child. But the caretaker supplement is $250 for one child and $150 for each additional child. Caretaker supplement is $250 for the first child and $150 for each additional child. And that is if you get SSI. And you apply for that somewhere else right now? Yes, you have to apply with your local income maintenance agency for that. You have to go to the job center. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that one's, that one's relatively easy because all they can do is you get SSI and they do have to do an income compensation to make sure. But if all you're getting is SSI, it's automatic. Yeah. And if it's, a, if it's the co-parents of a child, and both are getting SSI, it's automatic. Yes? How do you get the state SSI? Do you have to apply for that separately? Once you get, once, no, no. Social Security, there's, there's a lot that goes on in the background. It's this technical stuff I don't understand. But uh, <laughs> getting, getting federal SSI will trigger okay. the state SSI. Okay. And in certain circumstances, depending on the severity of disability, there's something called SSI-E. Which is fed, which is state? You may actually get a higher amount than the 8370, that? and that's. I have to admit that's always been a mystery to me. Sometimes I'm able to get clients the higher amount, but I never really know what goes behind that. I have a question. Yes. I might take a few steps back, but when you were talking about um, income for SSDI versus SSI, mm -hmm. if you have someone who receives SSDI mm -hmm. and they also are receiving a pension of around 500 per month, does that, does that affect their SSDI? I, I don't know. Okay, there is some interaction. I know that there's an, there's an interaction between Social Security retirement and pensions. But I don't, we don't often get into that situation because we don't generally see clients like that. Right. So, but that's something that, um, you know, obviously should be, should, be, should be reported. For disability benefits, it may not count. But I know that workers' comp and all those other factors, all of that is factored in 
and, and, and it, they're going to ask you about it when you apply for disability benefits. Right. But you can receive disability benefits with income, and it doesn't matter how much income is what you were saying earlier. Yeah. In general, yes. Right. Okay. Yes. I have one, one more thing to add. I think it's important for advocates to know that if someone applies for a caretaker supplement, they have to be working with their child support. Correct, yes. There are child support uh, cooperation requirements for um, just about every state benefit now. It's, gonna go, it's just been added to food stamps now. Uh, there are the good cause exemptions um, from cooperation. So you do have the right to, re to request those exemptions from, from child care corporation. Yes? Can you say more about what you just said, is that both parents have to be receiving SSI to get a caretaker supplement, or that it's just automatic in that circumstance? Both parents, if both parents are receiving SSI and no other income, then the, child, the caretaker supplement is going to be pretty automatic. If there's any income other than SSI coming into, whether it's a one-parent or two-parent household, then there is an income eligibility determination made for caretaker supplement. But if, it, if the only income is SSI, and if the only parent or both parents are receiving SSI, then that's pretty much a given. Okay. Okay. So for a single, a single head of household, they would be the only one that needed to be on SSI? Correct. Okay. And the kid cannot be on SSI. Right. The kid, yeah, if the kid's on SSI, that's the kid gets SSI. They're getting 735, not 250. If you get SSI, you get medical assistance. It's better care for disabled people. And that's critical. That's why it's so important that when you're looking at people on SSI and income, including employment income, you keep in mind that there are these that there is, that there are these triggers where you may lose significant benefits, not just get a reduction in benefits, but lose the benefit for a month or longer. So for somebody and especially of course somebody with SSI, um, who meets the disability definition for person purposes of SSI probably should be getting regular health care and should, should make sure that they remain eligible so they can continue to get medical assistance. Um, typically, if you're making enough money to lose your SSI, you're going to be over the income limit as an adult for Medicare Plus. So it's not like you can just switch back and forth for medical assistance for the elderly, blind, and disabled to Badger Care Plus. Remember how they count income for SSI if you're working. That's got to be fairly high income level for it, to, for it to trigger the loss of SSI. But when they're looking at that income for Badger Care Plus, they're not making those deductions. They're counting the full amount. So that's going to put an adult over the 100% poverty level for Badger Care Plus eligibility. At least on a monthly, on a monthly, um, computation. Um, annual income, annual income remains under 100 percent, then they should be eligible for that. Now, um, <clears throat> once you're on benefits, what are we looking at in terms of financial factors? Well, for Social Security disability or Title II, the only <laughs> income that matters is earned income. And if your earned income goes on over 1170 a month, you may wind up um, <coughs> suspended or terminated. There are, when you first get on benefits, there are something called a trial work period. And there's something that I call, it used to be called this, they changed the name, but I still call it the extended period of eligibility. So there's a period where you can try working. And in general, no matter how much you earn, you're not going to lose your Title II, your Social Security Disability. Then once you get past that period, there's an extended period where you can go on and off depending on your earnings. If you go over SGA, you won't get benefits for that money. Uh, but if you go back below, they'll put you back up. But that only lasts for a certain amount of time. 
And the other factor is that as we look at it down the road in general, you've got a lot of months of going over SGA, eventually you're going to be reviewed to determine whether you're still unable to engage in substantial gainful activity. Yes? I have a question. I just want um, for um, clarification. Can someone be receiving SSI and SSDI at the same time? Yes, because if your SSDI is low enough, you're disabled, right? You're getting SSDI because you're disabled. SSI is an income maintenance program based on income limits. If your SSDI is below the SSI income limit, SSI will bring you on. Okay. And if someone is on, let's say, um, SSI and they're, they're working, but they're not working like, they're working minimum wage, maybe, um, not a full-time schedule, but can they later then earn those credits and then later on get SSDI? They, as long as you're working and came into um, into Social Security, you're earning credits. Um, so you may be able to later get SSDI. That typically doesn't happen. What was the income limit for SSI again? 735 a month. It's on here. 735 for an individual, 1103 for an eligible couple. That's what they get. That's what they get. That is the income limit, and that is also what they get. Okay. Okay. Now remember, once you're on, how they count income is different. If somebody gives you $800 in a month, you're screwed. It's all counted. You're over the limit. You're off. <laughs> um, if you earn eight hundred dollars a month because of the deductions, you're still going to get SSI. It's, it's just a reduced amount. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. So I work with mostly chronically homeless people, and I have two of them who have gotten denied for SSDI, even though they're completely disabled. They're very obviously disabled, is it because they more than likely did not work five out of the ten past years? Well, if it's SS, are they still pending for SSI? And they got denied, but they uh, might still be in the appeal process, or within that time frame. You know, based on what you just told me, it could be both because there was a determination that they're not disabled. I mean, if they were denied SSI and they have no income, that denial has to be because they were found to not be disabled. So that would also affect the SSDI determination. But it's possible also that Social Security up front said, you don't meet, you don't have the quarters of coverage to have insured status. So we are going to look at you for SSI, but we're not going to look at you when you come to SSDI. Because one of the guys, he's pretty much legally blind. But he okay, but that doesn't address SSDI and whether he has coverage, does it? So has he worked five out of the past ten years? So that there's, and you know what? You can get a release. There's a release form that they can sign, and, you, and without without being a representative, and you can contact Social Security. Okay. Where can I get that release form? On the SSA website. Um, for SSI, there is also an asset limit, and an asset is any, they actually call it a resource is what they call it. There are countable resources and not countable resources. A home that you own and live in is not countable. Uh, one car is not countable. If you have a second vehicle and it's an, and it's sort of an adapted vehicle because you need it, that's the only way you can get around. That's not going to be counted. But once you get past that, once you get past normal household goods and stuff, once you get past adaptive equipment stuff you need to deal with your disability or help you negotiate things because of your disability, that's going to be counted as an asset. The, the cash is going to be counted as an asset or a resource. The value of these other <coughs> items is going to be counted as a resource. The asset limit is $2,000 for an individual and $3,000 for a married couple. Well, even now, if you own a home, I'm sorry. No, if you own a home and live in it, that's not counted. Is it one car per couple? Like if both of the... the yes, you don't get like how many people in the family, one car for each person. Right. <laughs> 
Now, there is a value. I mean, they, they look at the value of the car once you get past the first car. Um, but let's talk about income and assets for a minute. Um, what you receive in a month is income. It's only income in that month. It's never an asset. What you take into the next month is an asset. So if you have a bank account and you have $1,500 in that bank account and come October 1st, you get your SSI check goes into that account, that's put you over $2,000. But that's income in October. It's not an asset in October. So we go into October looking at what you had at the end of September, which was $1,500. And we're not going to add that $735 to your assets or resources in October, because that's income for October. Now, if for some reason you wound up not spending any money in October, and you go into the end of October with now $2,200 because we've added the $1,500 and the 735, you're over the asset in October. So it's important to keep track of things um, and make sure that you don't go over the asset limit. It, it's very easy now for people to just swipe their phones or do whatever and do stuff online and pay. For our clients on SSI, they need to be on top of things and know how much money they have in their account come the end of the month. And if they need to make a payment, maybe before it's due to get back under that $2,000, do that. How does the government find out how much you got in your account? They find out, let me tell you. <laughs> you're supposed to tell them if you go over. Okay, I know that. And if, if you, you don't, don't for do they, upon a review or something, go back and check all of your families? They, they may ask, to, they do periodic reviews and they may ask for bank statements. Um, you may have given a bank statement to somebody when you apply for food stamps, and somehow that makes its way to Social Security. There are a lot of matching programs. The other thing that um, can trigger, it, it's not direct, but it can trigger sort of looking into things is, your earnings record is out there, not out there for the whole world to see, but there's an earnings record. Social Security has an earnings record, the state has an earnings record. So that, that can trigger taking a closer look at the case. What about like a retirement fund, like an IRA or something? Does that come as an asset? It's going to count. What you can access for SSI is going to be counted. Yeah. What about gifting? If someone gives you a gift, I can see that the cash may be count as an asset. No, when you receive it, typically when you receive income, however you receive it, it's income that month. So a gift is considered income? Typically it's going to be considered income. And if you still have that that gift come next month, then it becomes an asset. So what you get this month is never an asset this month. What's left over is added to what you already had and is added to the Now why this is important is, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is because it can affect how you respond to an overpayment. If you went over, um, how that how that's treated. Are one time tax returns considered? <coughs> tax returns are not considered income because th that's money that you, um, that you already that's already been counted. That money was already counted or should have been counted when you were paid, and now you're just being refunded what you overpaid to the feds or to the state. Now, if you wind up saving that money three months down the road and it puts you to over $2,000, that's an asset. So we should tell people to hide their money. No, you don't tell people to hide their money because you're telling them to commit fraud. And both you and they are now committing fraud. So let me make that clear. We are not telling people to hide their money. If somebody says, what can I do legally with my tax refund? I don't want to spend it, but I want to make sure that I'm not homeless again in three months. What can I ethically tell 
tell them to do that gives them an option? They can, they can pay for necessities. Um, they can keep it under the limit. Um, they, I, I have to tell you, I don't, I haven't thought of this, they may be able to prepay rent. I'm not sure about that. They may be able to prepay rent. Um, there are certain things, and I don't have the whole list of exempt assets, but they're not going to help the situation. I mean, you can buy, a, you can set aside a burial fund. Well, how's that going to help a homeless person, you know, down the road, uh, maintain their housing? We're talking about earned income. We're talking about all income for SSI. So all income for SSI. So like let's say you have someone with SSDI who receive a back payment, their back payment is like ten thousand a year. That so doesn't matter for SSDI. Okay. So Again, it's separate. Okay. The benefit you get based on your work record is not going to be affected by your financial situation. Okay. It's only SSI, which is a need based program. Okay. Here's what happens with SSI, not SSDI, and income and assets. The way eligibility, financial eligibility for SSI is determined is, we're in September now. I know we're about to be in October, but let's stay in September. <laughs> at the beginning of September, they look at what they expect your income to be for September and what your assets are for September. If you are eligible based on that review, you get SSI for the month of September. If you are new to the SSI program, they will again look at September to decide how much your benefit is. If you are continuing on the SSI program, if you've been getting SSI all along, they do what's called retrospective budgeting. Your eligibility for September is based on September income and assets. But the amount of your benefits for September is based on any countable income from July. Yes? Now, when we're talking about SSI, I know we're talking a lot about the adult, but sometimes when the kids are doing SSI, does the parent income or asset make yes. a difference? Can you explain how that works? Well, yes. Uh, there's a formula which I can't go through, but there, there's something called deeming. And the income and assets of a parent, uh, of a custodial parent, or a caretaker relative, typically caretaker relatives, it depends on the precise relationship, um, are going to be deemed. Now they do take into account the whole family situation, who we're looking at, how many adults, how many children, and there's a pro rata amount. But, um, yeah, a parent's income is going to be counted uh, to some extent in determining a child's eligibility and a child's monthly benefit amount. But it just won't be at the level that you explained with the 65, got the $20 not counted? They go through a whole complicated formula. And no, it's not that precise formula because again, they account for other people in the household who are not on this. Like if there are four kids, that, that parent's income is gonna be deemed among the four kids. So only the portion that goes to the kid on SSI is gonna be counted against that kid's SSI. What's the max a child can get? 735, 735. plus the 8378 oh, in the state. So, um, if your SSI is suspended for a month because you go over the asset limit or because you go over the income limit, you can get back on the following month by showing that you've gone under the asset limit, by showing that you're back under the income limit. But if you go 12 consecutive months without getting any SSI, you're off. So month 13, you can't say, what oh, look, I'm under. Month 13, you go back to Social Security and file a new application. So it's important to avoid 12 consecutive months of suspension, meaning zero benefits. You can go five or six months with zero benefits and get back on in month seven if you show that you're under the limits. 
but once you've hit 12 months of zero benefits, you got to start from scratch. And I'm sure you know how long sometimes the process takes. And the thing is, they're looking at you now. They're not looking at you when they decided you were disabled five years ago. And things may have changed. One of the problems we often have is once people get on disability benefits, they may not necessarily continue to get medical care and treatment. Well, that causes two problems. One is you may not have the evidence to show, current evidence to show your condition. The second <coughs> is you may say you're not following prescribed treatment. And that's a basis for denying you benefits. So it's important. Certain conditions, they're kind of immutable. They're not going to change. If you've got, you know, um, somebody who, who was, you know, who had oxygen deprivation when he or she was born and has severe cognitive limitations, that's there. An IQ of 40 or a non-existent IQ at the age of 16 is not going to change. So they're not going to be reviewed. There's no medical treatment for that condition. I mean, the kid may get colds, the kid may break an arm, the kid may develop another disability, chronic disability. Um, but that fundamental disability that got them benefits, that's not going to change. So they're not going to be reviewed, really. Except at age 18, there's always a review when a kid turns 18. But for other conditions, including mental health conditions, treatment may improve your condition. Physical conditions, um, with technology and advances, adaptations may occur which may make it possible for you to engage in certain substantial gainful activities based on your work experience, education, and skills. So people are reviewed periodically to <coughs> whether they're still disabled. And that's both for the Title II SSDI and for the SSI. So people need to continue to see their doctors and get treatment and be able to show their current condition, if asked, and to show that they are getting treatment and following prescribed treatment. So we don't have a time frame for when they would be reevaluated. It's just random. It's not random. There is um, the system. They're they're diary, and it's it's based on at the time of the termination of disability. There there are levels of expected improvement that are coded in. And based on that, you may be reviewed in as, in, in as soon as two years. Others may be reviewed five years later. Everyone who's getting disability as a child is going to be reviewed at age 18. And it seems like if you work a certain amount of time, it triggers that sooner. I don't know Probably, if that's true yes. or not, but that's <clears throat> Yes. But it could be second year or five years after. Yeah. So it's important for them to be their right, and it's not just a one-time review. Those reviews can, can occur periodically. Okay. And then it's also, I would assume, important for SSI to be current with their address or some sort of mailing address. For all of them. That's how they're getting contacted. Yes. <coughs> not just that, but if they don't have an address, then they're no longer paying the rent, and they will cut you or cut your benefits accordingly. So I recently had that happen where somebody didn't have an address for a month or two, and they caught the benefits for that. So it's important to make sure that they have those addresses. Because if they don't have them, then they're next to you. Does it matter if there are any changes for disability benefits? Like no. It doesn't. So what matters is that they are paying a share okay. of their housing, of, of their shelter. So it doesn't matter if it goes up or down. It doesn't matter if it goes up or down. And you know, if you live in a 236 project or a long manufacturing project, or if you get Section 8, none of that is <coughs> So your benefits are not reduced because you live in low-income public housing and you pay reduced rent. Okay. Okay. What does matter is and this often happens with people before they get on SSI and during the early stages of SSI. Uh, you live with a friend or a sister or a grandmother. You have no income. This person is essentially supporting you. You're not paying rent. You're not paying for food. You get on SSI. At that moment, because of your situation before getting SSI, they're going to say you are living in the household of another. If you're living in the household of another, your benefits are cut. They're reduced by, um, I think it's a third. Once you show that you're paying your share, you'll go back up to the full benefit. Okay. 
Uh, the other thing that I, I just thought of, I'm sorry, going back to resources and assets, and I do see standards, so I'll get to you in a second. Sometimes people get, it takes a while, they may go to hearing, and they win, and they get a year or two worth of retroactive benefits. They have a certain amount of time to work down below the asset limit. You can be cut off because you got your retroactive benefits in January. They're not going to cut you off in February. But you also cannot pay on to $7,000 indefinitely. And again, that's something you need to know. I don't have it in front of me. I know I need to look at it when it comes up. Most of the stuff that we need to know is what matters, not necessarily the details. Because if, if something goes wrong, if, if people do what they're supposed to do, and something goes wrong, we think Social Security did the wrong thing, there are appeal mechanisms. We can go back and look at it and say, no, you're wrong. But if a client never did report, then that becomes a problem. And I'm sorry, there's a question over there. Um, can you talk a little bit more about when you said that a person is not eligible for Medicare until two years later? I don't know what else to say about it. I mean, so what, what is their health care looking like before that two years? Would they be expected to qualify for badger care? Like, they're, because you they're, said it's they're on their own depending on what their situation is. I mean, you can get Title II benefits and be under the poverty level. Right now, that's a hundred. That's $1,005 a month or 12060 a year. Yeah. So if somebody is getting it, uh, so you can get Title II, $912 a month of Title II. You're not going to get SSI when they over you. So that $912 is under the um, the Badger Care monthly limit. Okay. And if you multiply it over the years, under the Badger Care annual limit. So they can get Badger Care. But let's say your uh, Social Security Disability monthly amount is $1,250 a month. You're over the Badger Care limit. Both on, you may the first year, if you don't get retroactive benefits, and say you didn't start getting benefits until September, if you add up those monthly benefits for four months, that's under the annual limit. Mm -hmm. So you'll get Badger Care for those four months for the rest of the year. But come the next year, your monthly income puts you over the Badger Care limit and your projected annual income puts you over the Badger Care limit. So yeah, it's, it's one of the many gaps in our programs that leaves people uncovered. So hypothetically, a person could have badger care coverage, be, be doing whatever treatment, mental health treatment, that would keep them qualified because they have badger care coverage. They might lose that and then lose their SSDI because they're not following prescribed treatment, as you said. Well, or because they can't prove their condition that they're still disabled at the time. But, I mean, there is a fix, <laughs> which is not great, which is if you're not seeing a doctor because you can't get medical care and pay for it, there's always the, the fallback of a favorable consultative exam. And again, depending on the condition, it may be <clears throat> that the condition is immutable, so they're not going to review it or a review would be cursory. And it's yeah. not automatic that they're going to review it right. in a two-year period. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I have a client who does get SSI got cancer, he's incompetent, and he had a caretaker that took advantage of him. Like they took out an insurance policy for his accidental death. He gets $5,000 to make himself the beneficiary. I tried to call, and um, well, basically, what I'm getting at is there's three forms on the website, and is one of those going to let me talk to Social Security in order to cancel this policy from coming off because the insurance comes off his Social Security card every month? You're going to need to be an authorized representative or his guardian is going to have to do that or whoever has charge of his financial affairs or her financial affairs. He doesn't have anybody who is like a um, power of financial stuff. He's got. Well, then an authorized representative can probably contact Social Security to have that done. But you need to be an authorized representative. representative. You're probably going to need a 1696. There's a form. There's a um, form. On the site as well? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But how old is this person? 72. This person should call our local elder rights project. Because he, he can't hear. They're like, okay, he somebody should real call bad. on his behalf. Our elder rights project will get into it. And if there is abuse here that needs to be stopped, we'll work on it. Yeah, because we definitely are the bad okay. entertainer. But this is 
coming out of this very limited right. income. Thank you. Okay. So I have a question sure. um, regarding bank account versus like Drug Express Rush Card where they're getting their disability every month. Mm -hmm. Is that being looked at, like, like I had earlier, someone gets their back pay of $10,000 on their Drug Express Card? That's an nice I, my understanding was they're going to be $10,000 at once. No, they're not going to do that at once. That's true. $10,000 at once, so you're not going to do that. But, but two parts to it. One is you're right, because they, do, they don't give you a lump sum of money if it's a ton of money. But the more important thing that you're asking is, yes, whatever form that money is in, it's counted as an asset. For SSI. For SSI, yes. DI does not look at assets. Okay. DI does not look at income unless it's earned income. Okay. In general, I mean, there are these quirks. But, um, so, for DI, we want to keep people under the SGA if possible. There are, without getting too much into the weeds here, there are circumstances <laughs> under which certain expenses that are necessary in order for you to work can be deducted if those expenses are necessary because of your disability. That's called impairment related work expenses. Those can be disregarded in looking at whether you're making SGA. Um, I see an error here on maintaining eligibility for SSI and SSDI. It says SSDI twice. That second one should be SSI so cross out that D because it's for SSI that you want to keep income and assets below the limits. Uh, as we already discussed, you do need to continue to get medical care and treatment that to follow prescribed treatment um, to maintain eligibility for cases for you. You are required to, to report um, income and asset changes. That uh, for SSI, that's it. Uh, just about every letter you get, and I understand it because we all get stuff. We get our credit card bills if we get them on paper, and we look at the amount we owe. We don't look. There may be all kinds of other stuff on there. We may be signing off on all kinds of privacy stuff, but all we look at is how much do I owe, how much do I have to pay. We all do that with all sorts of stuff. People like our clients who have so much stuff going on, they just want to know: Am I getting it? How much? But it's important that they understand whether they read those letters or not, they're, they're obligated to say. So we've got to help them sometimes understand. We don't need to necessarily go through each and every item on the letter, but it's important that they know that there are things they need to report and that we can help them with that. To make sure that they get reports on time and avoid having problems. Social Security will occasionally send requests for information, requests for phone calls, questionnaires, and they're like got to respond to those because if you don't respond, you have to trigger an interruption in payments. So you're not like we know you're being you're being you're being I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you're saying. So like not like every year you don't have to re-report anything to them, it's just giving you a trigger. No, right? you have to, if you're on SSI, you must report any change in income when it occurs. When it occurs. Any change in that, any increase in assets over the limit when it occurs. They may also send an annual report. And if they suspect something, they definitely will. And if it's like a youth on SSI, yearly annually, they get asked yeah. how you use that money. They'll ask the payee. Mm -hmm. Yes, they'll ask the payee to show how that money was spent. For an adult, how is it decided that somebody is able to be their own? Um, sometimes the adjudicator will decide based on their assessment of the case that the person can't, there, there's always a decision made when the disability determination is made. Can this person handle their own money? That's made at the time that the disability determination is made. Sometimes even at, at, a, at a hearing decision, the judge will decide in the hearing decision. They won't often say this person can't handle his or her own money, but they may say, based on my decision here, based on my review of the case, I'm granting benefits, but I decided this person cannot handle his or her own money. 
Yes. How do you get that change? Like if somebody, you know, is. Are you changing the payee or are you changing the, the, the whether the person needs a fee? Because whether the person needs you, you need to then provide evidence to Social Security that, you know, from somebody or other. You know, sometimes it's just the t person turned 18, their disability is not a mental or emotional impairment which affects their ability to handle money. So it can be just based on changing age and becoming an adult and, you know, meeting his or her own needs. The other thing can be the therapist now says they reach the point where they can handle their own money. So we have a brain injured gentleman and he's gotten worse and worse and he's not being not doing that. Well, that, then I don't think you want to remove the payee. There is no payee. She, well, you can she ask for a payee. Yes. Well, I someone, can ask, pay. someone can ask for a payee. Now, you have to, okay, let me make a distinction here. I, as a lawyer, have certain ethical obligations, and I can't necessarily call us aside and say, my client needs a payee. You and your role need to figure out what your obligations limits, your professional obligations limits are in terms of what you can and can't do. I cannot go, you know, unless there's something imminent that my client is going to do that's going to harm somebody else. I cannot go and tattle. But they can choose themselves that they want to. They can, they can certainly ask for a payee. You can encourage the client to seek a payee. But, you know, those are the sorts of things where, you know, go to a doctor. I understand. I understand that. But um, what um, you know, uh, perhaps the landlord can write to SSA and say, "I'm not getting paid." Yeah, I mean, we hear that all the time. Is um, we're saying. I mean, you may be able to do it yourself. I just don't know what your obligations and ethical conditions are. I'm a mother with a child, and the father is getting SSI benefits to incorporate child support. I think that's always the struggle um, to get child support from someone that's receiving SSI. Yeah, it's a struggle. I mean, some judges will actually order it, but I don't know that we need you to, to get the Social Security to cut checks that way. Or do not cut checks, but this should payments that way. The caretaker supplement follows the child, not the parent. Well, the caretaker supplement, yes. but. Yes. And that's that's intended to support the child that is the person. That's if the mom is getting social security. No. no. Well. What is the custodial parent? The custodial parent. It's got to yeah. be a custodial parent. Yeah. Yeah. I've gotten. Well, we're not going to get into a back and forth here. I'll look into it and get back to you. Okay. But you're saying social security won't cut a check for the child. SSI is very. There's a big difference between how SSI is treated and SSDI. Because SSDI, SSI is, an, is a need-based entitlement program, so the assumption is that the recipient needs every cent of that. So you can't normally garnish it, you can't normally attach it. There are, there, slowly those protections are eroding. And in a, with a specific situation, I'd have to look at it and, and see whether it can be done. But typically, um, you're not going to get from a non-custodial parent's SSI child support to be. There may be an order, but whether it's paid is a different story. Okay. Um, yes. So we've talked a little bit about this, but I want to sort of uh, revise this. For um, somebody who is on either program, Going over SGA may or may not be a problem. Because of the way SSI works, you may wind up going over SGA and still getting SSI because of the calculations that are made up based on income. But eventually that's going to trigger somebody's Social Security going, wait a minute, they can do SGA. So the disability component will be looked at, not just the financial aspect. And for type of <coughs> disability, SGA pretty much takes you out of it. So that looks look at. Um, now, um, again, income or assets that reduce your SSI, your monthly SSI, to zero, if that goes on for two months, that's going to be a problem because your, your SSI will be terminated 
It's suspended for up to 12 months. Once you've been suspended for 12 consecutive months, you're terminated. Um, the other problem is, if you're not getting SSI, you don't get the caretaker supplement, you don't get the state supplement, you don't get medical assistance. Um, be careful in how, how, um, how gifts are conveyed um, in terms of assets and income. Uh, people can <coughs> buy you things. Now, if it's a diamond ring, that's going to be counted as an asset. The value is going to be counted as an asset. But people can, so long as it's not shelter or food, it's not going to be counted as income. Um, so there are certain such people can pay other bills for you. Um, people can help you with other stuff if it's in kind. They can't get. They can't say, okay, I need to go buy a new laptop. Um, they can't give you the money to buy a laptop. That's going to be counted as income. But they can't buy you a laptop and give it to you. Um, again, keep track of your monthly expenses, money coming in, money going out in your account to make sure that you stay under the $2,000 or that you can show that on, uh, on October 1st when um, you thought you had less than $2,000 because you had already sent payments out. You had set them up. You may want to make those payments before the end of the month to make sure that you're under the $2,000. Uh, a change in living situation can affect your SSI eligibility or amount of benefits. If you get married, if a child comes in or out of the house, if the status of a co-parent in your home or a spouse changes in terms of their receipt of disability benefits or income. Yes? So if I am um, a single parent who has been receiving Child, can I still get caretaker supplement, or do I lose that because I have a, a second? There's going to be there's your SSI is definitely going to be affected. Well, let's say he has no income of any kind. If he has no income of any kind, I don't think the child would be affected. I'd have to, I'd have to double check, but my initial response is the child would not be affected. I have to go back because once you've got somebody else in there, you got to go through all of this. You know the flow chart. But I think the child should be. Another thing that can cause problems for people in maintaining their eligibility and benefits is not responding to requests for information um, when it's written. And again, failure to provide medical evidence to prove continuing disability when a review is conducted. And again, that is something that doesn't necessarily emerge on the spot. I mean, it emerged on the spot in the sense that they ask for records and don't have them, but that's something that is cumulative in that you haven't been going to the doctor for a while, you haven't maintained a relationship with your healthcare provider so that they can provide you with evidence of their continuing disability. <coughs> now, one of the biggest problems we see with people is overpayments. And those overpayments occur because people didn't understand how certain events affected their eligibility and the amount of their benefits, and they didn't report information they were supposed to report to. Um, an overpayment occurs when benefits are paid to someone who's not eligible for those benefits, or when benefits, in the case of SSI, are paid in a greater amount than should have been paid. So that can occur um, typically in the case of an SSI if income or assets are not reported or changes in income and assets are not reported. In the case of SSDI, if you don't report that you're working in your SG substantial activity. Income of more than $20 for someone getting SSI is going to be looked into. 
If it's earned income, there are those deductions and everything. But once you get once you get over two hundred twenty dollars a month in income, that is a potential reporting event that you need to look. The client needs to check into whether it needs to be reported or not. Um, How long? Have you I think it's 10 days after the end of the month. Sometimes I confuse my programs, but I typically by the 10th of the month. Um, if your assets go over the limit, you've got to report that. Okay. Now, with overpayments, there are two parts to overpayments, which I'd like to talk about for, for a minute. I know I'm talking a long time, and I want to leave some time for just open discussion. I hope we can do that. There's the question of was there an overpayment? And there's a question, well, there's a question of was there an overpayment and what is the amount? And there's a question of even if there was an overpayment, do I have to pay it back? Um, and was there an overpayment is something that has to be appealed within those 65 days of getting a letter telling you you were overpaid for the amount of the overpayment. That's something that has to be a key. <coughs> um, I have seen only a couple of cases where, in fact, there was not an overpayment. Typically, when they say you know, there's an overpayment, there was an overpayment, there may be a um, disagreement as to the amount, how things were counted, how things were reported. But now they I don't want to say that they're wrong. They can be wrong about whether there was an overpayment in either program. But most of the cases we see do involve at least some sort of delay in reporting that may have triggered some amount of overpayment. But you do have to scrutinize when an overpayment comes in. Was there in fact an overpayment and is this the correct amount? Because that does have to be appealed within the 65 days. Now, whether you appeal an overpayment or not, if you miss the appeal deadline, if you decide there was an overpayment, there's another element which is called a waiver. And a waiver is, yes, there was an overpayment, but you don't have to pay it back. And a waiver can be granted if the individual was not at fault in causing the overpayment. And then typically the second element, although there are three different other factors, but the one that typically comes up is uh, it would cause financial hardship to repay the overpayment. Um, so how can this occur? Well, without fault can be uh, one of the most common situations is you have a child um, whose parent is not reporting certain information. That child, because of his or her age, isn't in a position to do anything, may also be because of mental limitations, isn't in a position to do the reporting. So that child is without fault. Yes? An example of somebody who's an intern, and there's a home didn't report that they were at the nursing home, so they've been getting their check. Well, it depends on that person's condition, because if that person is capable and has, is, has the mental wherewithal to report. Like she had no idea that she should be. Well, they, they, they send you letters. They send you notices. You can't say, I didn't know. There's a difference between um, neglecting your responsibilities and not having the capacity to learn about and carry out your responsibilities. And I'm not trying to be hard here and how I say it, but that's the way it's going to be looked at by Social Security. So it can't be, I don't know. If you're, if you're in evil, if you have a mental incapacity, that's a different story. So if somebody had a cognitive disability and were, say, unable to read the notices that they were being sent, that would not be... Or understand, even yeah. if they could read them. Yes, yes, if somebody's cognitively limited, if somebody has severe <clears throat> mental health problems, even if it's not a cognitive limitations where they just can't cope, so what notices we should be getting, though? I mean, like well, first of all, you get this yeah. when you get benefits, and they send it periodically. Whenever you get a notice, just about every notice that says we're changing your benefits or this is your benefit amount for this year, go back to those other pages because it's going to say your reporting responsibilities. It's going to list them all. 
change in the living situation, change in income, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think she's updated her address on that. Yeah, that, you know, I understand what you're saying, but yeah. that doesn't do it because, you know, seeing 1212 Stoughton Road doesn't necessarily mean automatically mean you know it's a nursing home. So, again, I, I'm sympathetic to the situation, but in the real world of Social Security, that's not going to be without a fault. So the child or the incompetent person, you've got somebody else who should be reporting. That that the recipient, him or herself, is not without it is without fault because of the overpayment. Then the next question is, is there going to be a hardship? If the person is currently getting any kind of public benefit, food stamps, badger care, or still getting SSI, that's an automatic. So if you can show them without fault and they're still getting need-based benefits, that's a waiver, pretty much. You gotta fill out a form, but that's pretty much it. If they're not getting benefits, you have to fill out a financial form, you have to list income and um, expenses and that sort of stuff and show that, you know, if there's more than $25 left over when you add it all up, they may say you can pay it back. I just had a question about the interaction. A lot of times with overpayments, if somebody's in subsidized hospital, they will have been getting an overpayment, they'll have paid high rents, high, you know, their other benefits are high. They're paying high based on that overpayment. All of a sudden, you've got a massive overpayment. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not. So let's say somebody's in subsidized house. I understand that part. Okay, so they're paying based on this high amount. They're paying their rent based yes. on the sign up. What, how much they pay in rent, I am not, I used to do a lot of housing in Brenton Oast. Uh, I left the world of Section 8 about 20 years ago and low-income public housing, so the computation of income for purposes of rent is not something I'm on top of. I guess what I'm asking is, so there's interactions between the systems, you said. So if there's an overpayment that somebody, you've made this big overpayment and so their money is reduced, is there any way then to, to merge the housing side of it? And what I'm saying is I don't know that. Okay. There's a difference between exchanging information and how that information is treated and the the housing programs have their own HUD regulations on how income is counted I can tell you that for income maintenance programs um, it depends on the program if you're paying back an overpayment the full amount of the benefit is counted because you're paying back the debt that's in, you're receiving this income it's not coming into your hands but this income debt is yours is now being used to pay back a debt so the income maintenance program counts to you even though you're not actually seeing it. So you'd have to check back on the uh, particular very, very Yeah. I feel like it would all even out though, really, because your overpayment, they're gonna garnish your check and then you're gonna report that high and so your rent's gonna be low, like thirty percent less. Why not? Because it's how is income counted <coughs> by the program. So you can't assume that under HUD, I don't know, maybe Brenda knows, she deals with this stuff more than I do. <laughs> let's, not, let's, let's not spend a half hour on this. It's something that you need to look at, okay? And, and what's gonna determine that is the HUD regs, not, not any social security rules. Can you talk about the relationship with like filing a tax return and SSI and SSDI? if there's like, any correlation between filing your taxes, do you have to file an SSDI, an SSI? SSI is not, doesn't, doesn't trigger a um, filing, but I believe SSDI does, and the, the filing trigger, I believe, right now is $6,200. <coughs> oh, that's for earned income. There's a different filing trigger if you have other income. And so, yeah, that's taxable. Oh, yes. uh, at a certain level, not not a, not from you know the first dollar, but you know, it's, it's it's included. It's included in taxable income. So they should. Uh, they may need to. They may need to. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, for SSI, yeah. if you have no works, if your overpayment is not waived, or and sometimes part of the overpayment is waived, part is not. What you'll see in these letters is they'll, you know, they'll let something sit for ages, and then all of a sudden you'll get 
and overpayment notice with like five different discrete periods. And they may decide that the 2012 overpayment can be waived based on the factors for, for, for waiver, but that the 2013 overpayment can be waived for whatever reason. Um, we can protect ourselves to make sure that um, that, I mean, even though clients are reporting, but like for something that's so old, like well, if they report, it's going to be accurate. Mm -hmm. What's old is that they get information late, um, and then then put it into the system that the client didn't report. Typically, um, overpayments are not based on Social Security's failure to act on a report. Overpayments that I've seen are typically based on the client's failure to have reported. So you have to make sure we got So we have to make sure that the clients report. Um, and the thing is, again, if they report something they didn't have to, one of two things will happen. Either nothing will happen, or Social Security will incorrectly take action, and that can be appealed. Um, if you're getting SSI, Typically, an overpayment is recovered by reducing your SSI by 10% a month. You can voluntarily agree to more, but typically it's limited to 10% a month because it's a need-based program, so they don't want to take away all your money. Title II, SSDI, that's not need-based. So they may come in and take the whole amount um, because um, they can. So then you've got to go back and say, wait a minute, this is my only income. Let's talk about continuing my SSDI but withholding a smaller amount. And they will do that. I mean, they, they've got program rules for doing it. They've got a manual for doing that and guidelines for doing that. So, but, but it's not an automatic. You've got to go in and get that done. Now, knowing what to report, people do get these things. And these are available for Social Security Office. There's also, if you go to, there it is. These are also online, so you can print them out in better than booklet form so that you have them in for working with clients. And they cover stuff that I haven't covered here. You know, about rights and responsibilities. They talk about some of the work programs that you can go into where the income won't be counted or where you can protect your SSI <coughs> while you participate in a training program to develop workability so that you can become independent um, and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, we got to make sure that clients understand their obligations or that we help them report if they can't understand their obligations that they at least know to come to us and say hey this happened and we help them report. We've got to know that um, money left over from the previous month is added to the money you already had set up, set aside in a bank account or in a, an EBT card or whatever. Um, and that that's going to be added up toward the limit. The full amount in a joint account with somebody is going to be counted as your money. So you may have a joint account with um, a relative because you want that relative to help you manage your money. That's a joint account. You each have equal access to it. So even though for whatever reason you've got this joint account and you, you agree among yourselves, half is yours or half is mine, or a quarter is mine and the rest is yours, that's not the way it works for Social Security because you can in a joint account, you can walk in there and screw your buddy and take all the money out. Um, you have the right to do that. So Social Security is going to count it all. Yes? Um, I, it is going back to something we talked about earlier. Now, domestic partnership, if you file for domestic partnership, is that similar to the marriage <coughs> where that can harm your benefits? I don't know. Okay. I, I, I think that now because of the the, the, the Supreme Court's marriage decision, I think most programs are looking at um, marriage only. Okay. Uh, because you can marry in all 50 states, but I'm not, I'm not certain of that. Okay. Um, but if a domestic partner is commingling money with you, that doesn't matter what your relationship is, um, it's, gonna, it's gonna be counted. Okay. okay. Um, 
remind the client to keep going to the doctor, going to therapy, taking pain meds. Keep diaries, especially for uh, bless you. Um, keep diaries that show the difficulties people are having. If it's physical limitations, you know, pain diaries, stuff like that. If it's people who have panic attacks, anxiety disorders, other problems, keep diaries showing the sorts of events that trigger it, how frequently these things happen, how these limitations occur. It's, it's, it's tough. It's a full-time job being able to maintain your benefits. It really is documenting what you need to document to remain eligible. But, you know, as much as clients say it's pain, you have to remind them they're the ones living life day to day who know what's going on. We don't know these things unless they tell us, unless they write them down. So as much as we can try to help them, we're limited by the information they can help us get. Um, beware of the deadlines, read the notices, read the letters, go through stuff periodically, every once in a while. You know, when there's a moment of, of calm, say, okay, Let's go through this booklet and make sure that we don't have anything we have to report, anything we have to worry about. This the one. Yeah. And there's one for <coughs> Yes? Um, I went to a SOAR training, I think, a year ago, which is, a, I don't know if you know what that is. The SOAR training is to help advocates um, specifically help like transient homeless individuals apply for SSI. Mm -hmm. and kind of do a lot of the legwork that would be harder for them to do. Um, and one thing they talked about, and I don't know if you have experience with this or if this is still valid, but as advocates who have direct contact with people, whether it's through homeless services or home visiting, is you have the ability to say, I've known this client for two years, we had monthly visits, they appeared, you know, um, disheveled or, you know, whatever physical and kind of what you're talking about, keeping diaries of a person. Yes. Exactly. You absolutely can do that, but you have to be careful to not also, you sort of discredit yourself if you're also their advocate in that process. Um, I mean, it diminishes the credibility that they give to what you have to say if you're there as their advocate as well. But if you're there as a witness, yeah, you who interact with them, who see them struggling with their homelessness, with the mental health issues that prolong their homelessness, with the physical limitations that make it impossible for them to to do the sort of um, work that someone with their educational and skills limitations can do, that that's all very valid. Yes, yeah. and, and that she, in the form of a letter or testimony is very important. And she even said that if you if you are able to have communicate with a medical professional and have it signed that that medical professional has been has evaluated that information, knowing the patient, kind of as a supplemental thing, that that can be turned as, as medical evidence um, to the Social Security office. Well, I think a medical professional can indicate what the condition is, what the diagnosis is, what the symptoms are, and that you can provide information about that and the medical professional may be able to say what I see here is consistent with the diagnosis and the symptoms but the medical professional cannot verify what he or she himself hasn't witnessed right so yeah they can but they can certainly back each other up and in fact one of the questions I asked somebody yesterday at this fact finding was you have interacted with this person you've seen this kind of behavior right you've seen this kind of behavior right you've got this email with all this stuff written it right is this consistent with what you've heard from the medical professions and what you've seen in the medical report about this person mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay. okay so you can um, have clients contact us any of our numbers not the number you see here please <laughs> that's for you if you've got questions you can email me or call me if you've got questions about issues <laughs> Otherwise, clients can call any of the LAW numbers and they will be directed to the right person. I will get back to Melissa on some of the questions that, um, that were raised today. And if you get any more, you know, let me know and I'll get back to you and get answers on those. I have one more great question. Yes. The SSDI and SSI can come at different times or is it all the same time? 
I don't remember the timing. They will not come. They'll come if you're both on SSI and SSDI. They will be transmitted as separate payments because they come from separate classes of money, separate systems. So you'll see, like, uh, if it's an EBT account on a, on a card, you'll see separate deposits. If it's a bank account, you'll see separate deposits. And same for state SSI. That's going to be different. And now, the state SSI and CTS may come together, will come together. If there's a caretaker supplement benefit, that's going to be lumped together with the state SSI as a single thing. Thanks for listening. Thank you.